Hey, hi, I'm Jared Nigro, uh, the COO of the Los Angeles Railroad Heritage Foundation, um, as well as on the board of um, the LA City, uh, City Historical Society. So I'm gonna share my screen right now. Okay, so um, I just was gonna, so this is a famous crash that um, has uh, has a presence online um, all the time and it's at Philippe's The Original in downtown um, LA. So you may have seen the image before and I'm just gonna read to you real quick. This is from the LA Times, January 25th, 1948. <clears throat> There's an image of this crash. And the article says uh, the local, um, says a gleaming 600,000 pound four unit Santa Fe diesel passenger train locomotive overshot the field at Union Station yesterday and stopped just short of making a crash landing in Elisa Street 20 feet below. It halted with a third of the 150,000 pound leading power unit hanging in the air. Leaning on a Pacific electric pole, it pushed to a drunken angle. No one was hurt, but an army motor pool car driver for McCormick General Hospital, Pasadena, escaped probable death only by a bit of quick driving action. PFC Wayne A. Schmidt, uh, 19, of uh, East Los Angeles, um, had driven to the station to pick up some patients. Schmidt was directly in front of the locomotive when it ran out of the track, ran over the steel bumper and started for him. The locomotive moving at what trainmen said was two or three miles an hour, struck the light car in the side, Schmidt jammed into the lower low gear and he, as he said, Gunder for there. Gunder out of there, sorry. A moment later, the ponderous engine had rumbled across the 12 foot wide concrete roadway and ground throughout the foot, uh, foot wide concrete barrier. Five hours later, with the help of a 250 ton crane, the locomotive had pulled itself back on the tracks and was taken to the roundhouse for inspection and repairs. So that's what was published at the LA Times when that happened. But leaves a lot to be desired. So let's talk about this and the photograph itself. Now this is um, called the day the captain almost dropped in for a French dip. And it's the history of the Santa Fe number 19 crash. Now this was written by our late uh, co-founder and CEO, Joseph Lesser. So this is his presentation about this. Uh, I think we, we read it in first person at some times because he wrote this, but uh, I'll, I'll try to put it in uh, Joseph's voice as much as possible. Okay, so, so 1963, J.K. Lesser Productions, that's Joseph K. Lesser Productions, it was contracted to photographically, photographically document the construction of the Beckham Auditorium in Caltech. So he loved barbecue, he loved, you know, Philippe's sandwiches, and so he would always stop there and get a French dip, even um, way up until, um, you know, his last couple of months, he was always there, we were always there um, getting the sandwiches. And so while he was there, there's a picture on the wall um, of this crash, um, the one you've all seen in the advertisements. So uh, Flues have been doing, they, you know, if you don't know them, they've been doing it for over a hundred years for guests all the time. It's a, a, a fantastic spot to watch a Dodgers game or just to get that LA feel. It's really close to LA Union Station. Originally, it was located on Elisa Street, directly across from the street of the LA Union Passenger Terminal, what we call Union Station. Um, the restaurant was there long before Union Station was built in 1939 and had to relocate in 1951 when the Hollywood Freeway was built, 101. Its new and current lo location is still within eyeshot of, of, our, of Union Station. So if you're ever there and you want to, you know, find it, you just kind of have to exit the main entrance and it's... Um, just a couple blocks away. So this is the photograph at Philippe's that has uh, been in the same spot since 1951. Um, picture has seen better days. It's been up there for so long. And so Joe wanted to know who took this and what was the story behind it. Um, and the the like I read the LA Times article didn't really say much. So he was curious and so. Um, this is around in the, uh, by the eighties, Joe was really interested in, um, Los Angeles, uh, railroad and railroad rail in particular, but specifically LA rail. Um, you know, he was, you can, as you can see 
behind me sort of, um, these are all stick built models, like handmade models of um, PE cars and Larry cars. Those were, that was our public transportation when LA had like a vast booming, it is quite booming now. I don't want to say it isn't, but, it, but when we had a really excellent, excellent um, uh, system, Pacific Electric cars, Larry cars, um, <clears throat> all throughout town. And he loves this and he loves Santa Fe, Southern Pacific and UP, Union Pacific railroads. So he started to learn more. And when he looked at this um, photograph, he saw the Warbonaut, Santa Fe Warbonaut number 19 diesel uh, hanging over the edge of the Union Station. Now this is a beautiful, um, this is a beautiful uh, 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 locomotive. This is, uh, I'll show you in one of our models and I can kind of show you the color of it. This here, this is a number 20, but that doesn't mean it's, it's not too close. We don't have the number 19 on hand, we have the number 20, but it's the same, same idea. Now this is, you know, a scale, but it's exact in, in color and, and, and model style and the details are all right there. It's really quite impressive. Um, the way that uh, the, the, um, the colors and the, and the design, it's all, and at the time it was really something interesting to see. Um, and so, so this is the, the this is like the uh, Santa Fe Warbonaut that, uh, uh, or Warbonnet, uh, some people call it. Um, that that kind of gauges interest. It's really easy to, to to spot. So the number nineteen. So in the beginning, so let's talk about a little bit about the number nineteen. So the number nineteen is a set of four units, each putting out a hundred, uh, one thousand five hundred horsepower. The four units are numbered and identified by the Santa Fe as nineteen L or the lead unit, then nineteen A, B, and C as the rear, and together they are known as a locomotive. Okay. So um, they're manufactured by Electric Motive Division of General Motors in Illinois. And the EMD has turned out, that's Electric Motive Division, has turned out more diesel locomotives than any other builder in the world. So this was a booming time. And um, we were, at this time in America, we were really um, putting out some really fantastic designs. Um, and, and rail was growing because we had so much space to cover. We were, we were really growing at a rapid rate. In 1970, for example, this facility worked two and a half shifts, cranking out four and a half units per day. Four and a half of something like this. This is pretty incredible. In 1971, they were up to six units per day. And so this picture here is of the floor. You can see um, at different stages um, where, these, where um, the construction would, would be. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's in Illinois. Okay, so, and here's an image of it. This is a beautiful image of the uh, Warbonaut, Warbonnet coming out. This is number 37, but you can see it coming through. I and mean, it's, it's really a, go a gorgeous design. So for almost 41 years, this locomotive captured here on its maiden run um, at Pasadena started out as a beautiful Santa Fe Warbonnet, Warbonnet uh, and we're going to follow it through its life's end. Before number 19 reached its third birthday, it encountered a pretty rough time, and a man was there to document those unhappy circumstances. So that's another part of the, you know, the mystery behind this photograph is who took it. So his discovery. So but before getting too far into the story of the number 19, there's another player in this drama, which is the photographer. So in June 1997, Joe attended the Santa Fe Railway Historical and Modeling Society Convention in Sacramento, California. So Sacramento, if you have not been to Sacramento, it is, um, it is a, a beautiful place to go if you are a rail fan or if you want to learn more about rail history. Um, there's museums, there's all um, types of like historical societies, modeling societies. So it's just really an excellent place to, to go to. Um, if you want to learn more and see more. I know I have friends from Sacramento who all say that, you know, their field trips are uh, always included growing up, going, going to the museum and that uh, made a rail fan out of most of them. So, um, so anyway, so there was a, there was the photo on display with the other prize winning photographs and rail railroading uh, railroad models. And it was dated and signed by Fletcher H. Swan. And so now 
We know the name, but who is this Fletcher Swan? So here he is as a young, as a young man here. Um, so Fletcher was born in Los Angeles in 1923, and he was raised in South Pasadena, which is not, it's a hop, skip, and a jump away from our offices here in, in uh, Eagle Rock. Um, so that's where he became the mayor. He became the mayor of South Pasadena for three years during his eight year tenure of the Southern Pasadena City Council. And for those of you who don't know, Southern, uh, South Pasadena and Pasadena are not the same. You know, this is two separate entities, um, two, two separate uh, cities. So his family owned Swan Stationers in South Pasadena, in which he would eventually become the proprietor. So he's in the city council, he's running business, he's, he's a man about town. Um, uh, people on our board have been to uh, Swan Stationers at times, so people know this, uh, know his family and the legacy in South Pasadena. His hobby throughout his youth was primarily railroad photography, and he rarely went anywhere without his camera, and he even carried it to work with him. So in 1942, Fletcher began working for the Santa Fe as an engine wiper. So what does that mean? Well, Joe says that's right. He washed and cleaned the windows of the locomotives when he was 19 years old. So this was at the yard, this was cleaning, this is when they're um, about to go out or come back in, cleaning these locomotives. They get very dirty, obviously. Within two months, he had advanced to crew collar, and then two months later to roundhouse clerk at the Redondo Junction facility. Redondo Junction facility is, um, is pretty major, it's a pretty major um, junction. Um, and a roundhouse clerk is a big deal. So he, he kind of climbed his way up pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so that's the, this is a, um, by the way, this is a junction and you can see number 17, um, Santa Fe there, um, 64 is the one to the right. Um, so that's what it looks like, okay. So this is this image is a little different than what I'm going to say, but his railroad career was interrupted by the Second World War, um, during which he served in the Army Air Force. So this image that you're looking at here, this is South uh, Santa, South Santa Fe. Uh, this is their contribution to the war. This is um, Victory Rides and Wheels. This, uh, uh, this is all about like how they contributed um, to to the military and the uh, Navy and uh, such. So Fletcher was once seen riding in the cab of a helper locomotive pulling the Santa Fe California Limited, <clears throat> proudly wearing his uniform on leave, but still carrying his camera. This time the engineer turned the camera on Fletcher. So that's where you got this image here. Uh, this is when he's um, taking off um, on leave. So when Fletcher Swan returned from the army to work in Santa Fe uh, in July of 1946, Fletcher was once again assigned to the job of the roundhouse clerk. Um, from this job, he went on to become diesel clerk in the diesel office and then returned to the roundhouse office as first shift roundhouse clerk, which is a big deal. Um, this would be his last assignment for the Santa Fe as he resigned in 1950 to run his family business. Um, but you know, once you're a man of the rail, you're always a man of the rail. So his heart was always with Santa Fe. All right. So what did he use to, to, to photograph this image and how did this work out? So he used a four, four by five speed graphic equipped with a four F4.7 Ektar lens, sorry. So it's a four by five. So you're getting, that's why we have such great quality images there. Four by fives are, Beautiful. Um, I they they uh, stand up and they're so rare now. I think you can't buy a four by five um, film with for less than a dollar. Uh, uh, so you, every time you take a photograph, it's like costs you a buck. Um, usually he used four by five cut film for fast shooting at twelve exposure film packs. <clears throat> On Sunday morning, January twenty fifth, nineteen forty eight, Fletcher was working in his dark room developing film. And his wife knocked on the door and said the roundhouse office called and there was some sort of derailment at Union Station and they asked if he could take some pictures. So it was important to take pictures for multiple reasons. One, to document this, but two, it would help Santa Fe, it helps Union Station, it helps figure out what happened, the damage done, the insurance, and also who knows what else is gonna happen, you know? So having no idea what happened, he drove to the track 
and he was told that the accident was at the south end. So he drove as far as he could and then walked the rest of the way. Um, and there was the incident. It was the number 19 with its lead unit. That's what's up there. Uh, the, this, this uh, lead unit hanging 16 feet out over Elisa Street. And the locomotive had just brought in the streamliner El Capitan from Chicago at 8.45 a.m. when the accident occurred. And the streamliner El Capitan is, was really a, a famous streamliner. I mean, that's a, a beautiful ride to take. And that's a famous trip from Chicago to LA. Like this is, you know, um, a really beautiful uh, trip. A lot of celebrities take this. Uh, people were traveling back and forth, and especially on, on that particular streamliner. This is uh, a nice ride. And, uh, and uh, 8.45 a.m. So this is a terrible way to start a Sunday morning, and especially in January. You can see it was kind of cold, rainy out. So there was some confusion about whether this train was actually the Al Capitan or the Super Chief. So this is a, okay, so this is a, uh, there's a difference. So checking the employee timetable, number 134 for the Los Angeles Division, 2nd District dated December 14th, 1947. The document describes the four trains listed to arrive that morning. So train number 19 was the chief. Train three was the California Limited that we had mentioned earlier. And train one was the Scout. Train 17 was listed only as streamlined. And since the El Capitan was train number 21 when it ran separately, and the super chief was train number 17, adding in comments by W.E. Hartman, general superintendent, he's the general superintendent of motor powers for Santa Fe, and he was interviewed about this. It's safe to assume the two were combined at that time, running together as train 17. So they weren't quite sure, um, but this is what sort of happens um, at this time. So there's, there's um, three different trains running and, and they get combined. And so this is how this can lead to confusion. So let's talk a little bit about the, the engineer. So the engineer, this is not the engineer you're seeing in this image. This is an, an, an engineer. Um, uh, but you get the idea of what it looks like through their point of view, what they're doing, who they're calling, you know, all of this um, equipment inside. Um, so the engineer on that train was Fred A. Hurst. He was the resident of nearby Huntington Park, and Hearst was hired as a fireman in July 1915 and promoted to engineer in July of 1929. So they had firemen, uh, firefighters, um, on on in for rail specifically, um, in case anything would go wrong, obviously. So he was a veteran engineer. By by this time, since you know he's an engineer in 1929, he's been doing this for quite some time, and he was a veteran engineer, and uh, his fireman was on the train was Frank E. Uh, Rittenhouse. So they had an, an assigned firefighter. You think that you would be in good hands. You have this veteran, you have the fireman. So the Barstow was a division point and all passenger engine crews changed at that location. So Barstow, if you haven't known, if you don't know if you're in Cal if you aren't in California, not that, not too, too far away from here, but that's usually, um, the division point in California. It's a big um, point uh, for rail. Crews would ideally leave Los Angeles on a late afternoon run, change at Barstow, then come right back the next morning. Train 17, this is the one we're talking about, left Barstow, headed for Los Angeles at approximately 5 a.m. After arrival at Union Station, the locomotive came to a complete stop and then was uncoupled from the train by a herder. So this here, do you see this tiny piece right here? It's a coupler. So if something becomes uncoupled, so the way that this, this would link here is another, something that looks exactly like this would come in and sort of hook in to this. Um, and so this little piece right here sort of holds it in and there you go, it's linked. And there's not just that, there's multiple ways, but you can see it on the front here as well. They have what they call couplers. So it became uncoupled um, from the train by a herder. Herders were the trackmen assigned by one of the main lines at Union Station to work the station requirements. So a herder did this. 
each main line, the um, SP, the Southern Pacific, Santa Fe, and Union Pacific would take turns at this assignment. At that point in LA Union Station, and we'll get into this um, late, a little later, but this is how Union Station worked at that time, that they, you had these three that um, ran, sort of ran Union Station. They were the ones that, fun, like, how, you know, were, it was their station. They, they were very much a part of it. It wasn't like it was owned separately and then they were in space, whatever, it was this, these three came together. So during the uncoupling, the firemen would drop down from the lead cab and walk back to the C unit or end unit and climb aboard the C unit. A hand signal from the herder told the engineer to move ahead toward the bumper in preparation to move through the crossover and to see the release track, ultimately heading for the roundhouse at Redondo Junction. So this all is practice, this is all understood, but there's, and so the question is how did this happen? So there's only one way in and out of Union Station, even today. So Fireman Rittenhouse was in 19C, waiting for two rings of a bell from the engineer to change operating ends. It was at this moment, while the locomotive was beginning to slowly proceed towards the bumper, that Hearst, the engineer, prematurely turned uh, the MU2A valve, eliminating the air brake controls from the locomotive. So a premature uh, release of that uh, for the locomotive. In doing so, Hearst was unable to apply any braking to slow or stop the locomotive as it moved forward. At that point, he didn't have that control. So in retrospect, what should he have done? We should never have had his hand on the valve until the locomotive had come to a complete stop. So that's how it was prematurely done. So when you um, have your hand on the valve beforehand, you have the chance of, of um, releasing it too quickly and being unable to break. So that's, you know, what they're saying. Um, the EMD model F3, that's electric photo division model, F3 operating manual under section one, this is how a specific Joe would get, under section one, paragraph 159 gives the precise instructions for changing operating ends. The MU2A valve, the nomenclature used by the Santa Fe in its air brake manual is identified in the EMD manual as a brake valve cutout cock, okay? So under the circumstances, the fireman could do nothing. So he was completely powerless. At this point, everyone's basically powerless. The locomotive's breaking air had been totally shut down. So we really couldn't really do anything. So as scary as it sounds, the locomotive had no operable brakes um, and it couldn't slow or stop at that point. So now they're kind of hitting this realization that there's really nothing we can do. Um, which is always amazing to me because if you see this power line here and it, it's, it's, it's pinned against this and bending it, it's, this is such a, you know, 600,000 pounds moving forward. It's really amazing that it stopped right there and didn't snap the, the lines or uh, anything else. And that's always, I think this like giant um, question for me is, you know, how sturdy, I mean, these lines are really sturdy then if they can take a collision like this. However, it was moving slowly. That's the one benefit, but at 600,000 pounds, I mean, I think, you know, how slow. So it slowly rumbled forward to the end of track bumper, which would stop, which should stop it at the end of the track, the bumpers that you see. And across a 12 foot wide concrete roadway. So now it's just on the road, climbed to the curb of the sidewalk, and directly through the foot wide concrete wall barrier. So let's go back. So you can, we have a couple of images. Of this. So you can see it from this side. So this is the, this is going right now on this concrete walk and 12 foot wide. And then it's going through the foot wide concrete barrier. So you really think like, should all be able to stop it and uh, no. And you can see, this is a little pixelated, but you can see it coming off the other end. You can see the pieces of this foot wide rail here hanging off. 
and this is oh here's a good example of the coupler up front you can see below the um engineer you can see a, like a close-up of the coupler that's what was got uncoupled and let it start to, to lose control and then here you go you can see the you can see it dangling off there um sorry so it's so when it finally stopped the f2 hung over elisa street about 20 feet below so you can see the top of the hats of people below this is 20 feet and you know luckily if you look at the parking signs it says uh no parking but sunday's exempt so he did get lucky there uh the remainder of the engine was resting on its battery case and the belly and belly tanks and rear trucks on the platform's border roadway so that's how it did get eventually is is it could go up the front could go up over but then the um back right here this is also by the way the belly so it got it, it started to slow down and get caught and then this eventually the back um, got kind of stopped it got pinned against the concrete there so the remainder of the engine was rushing at blah, blah, blah. the santa fe officials with his hands on his hips examining the damage Oh, that's in that back picture I was showing you. Um, naturally, the engineer was stunned. So what's going on inside? So naturally, the engineer was stunned and probably glued to his seat, not knowing if the locomotive was going to crash onto the street. So they're just holding on tight. Maybe they're running to the back to try to add a few extra, you know, 100 pounds to, to keep it. I don't know at this point. Only after it came to a complete stop did Hearst gently walk back through the engine to get off. So he had a go back to the front. Fireman Ritterhouse, Rittenhouse bailed out as soon as he realized something was amiss. You know, some of us hold on, and some of us go, I think this is my exit ramp. So two different people, but ultimately it worked out. The Los Angeles the Police Department immediately blocked off all traffic on Elisa Street. After Fletcher shot his pictures from the station platform, he drove his car around down to Elisa Street. Because he was a railroad employee, the, he was allowed access to this blocked area. And that's how we can be like right under looking at this. Across Elisa Street, Philippe's customers poured out of the restaurant to view the spectacle. Now, that's where how close it was. And that's why that image is in Philippe's the original. You know, uh, this view, this is a view today of the barrier wall where number 19 came crashing through. So it's still there. You see the barrier, you see the bumpers, you see the concrete. This is a clearer image, and especially if it's cut in color, it's a little easier to see. It really has to go through quite a bit of heavy material to, to do it, but uh, you know, it, it, these things happen. So they really, they built it back up. The hook was called in from the Southern Pacific Taylor Yard Roundhouse. Um, there was an agreement by the three railroad companies that SP would handle derailment at the at LAUPT the Union Station. So the hook came in to scoop it out, and this was Southern Pacific's um, territory in the in their agreement of what happens at LAUP, LAUPT. The first order of business. So even though it was Santa Fe, it was SP that had to do the cleanup. The first order of business was to attach a cable from the 50 ton crane to the 19C to make sure that the locomotive didn't move any further forward. So first they had to remove the weight from the back end in case something would happen that would continue to push it forward. To pull the 19L lead back onto the tracks was slow and tedious. And it took five hours to get this guy back. <clears throat> With the use of the tires, or some kind of sliding shoes, the locomotive was coaxed back onto the track. Using the power of the remaining three units, the diesel headed for the roundhouse. So they got back on track and then just couldn't sit there. They had to take it to the roundhouse. Fortunately, only the front end had been damaged. Once back at the roundhouse, the repairs began and to everyone's amazement, the number 19 was back in service in only a few days. So that seems like an impossible thing um with all that damage there but that goes to show you you can drive through a foot of concrete and get a couple of scratches and then be ready to go these were powerful machines so after the accident what what's the aftermath of all of this so after the accident the railroad always conducts an investigation so what happened why did it happen how did it happen who was responsible 
So since there was no injuries, um, no ICC was involved. It was purely Santa Fe investigation. Santa Fe, Santa Fe investigators ultimately found that the engineer was responsible, which we had sort of said with the brake valve, having been wrong for cutting the, out the air brakes prematurely. Fred Hurst was removed from service the next day and he never returned to duty. That was it. He had had enough. Fireman Rittenhouse was absolved of any responsibilities in the matter. He was the guy that jumped, but it really wasn't his fault. There was nothing he could do at that point. In the next, the next saga in the life of number 19, less than one year after the Union Station accident on October 30th, 1949, also a Sunday, the Al Capitan train 22 with number 19 on the head and plus 14 cars deported, departed the Union Station at 1.30 in the afternoon bound for Chicago. Okay, we're going back into, back in it. It was clipping along between 60 and 70 miles per hour when less than an hour after it, it hour after it struck a section of broken rail at um, Kincaid, 1.3 miles west of Azusa. I may be mispronouncing Kincaid, but I think that that's what it is. But that's, there you go. Look at that. Maybe that's not the exact image, but that's what happened, basically what happened. So broken rail, it happens. So it had a, a pretty unfortunate experience there. Here's we're looking here, we're looking at West with the lead unit 19L overturned to the left side of the right away, which caught fire. So it was even more damaging this time around. This is a picture of a different rack just outside Redondo Junction, but this gives you an idea of what it looks like when it falls to its side. Other diesel units went to the right side, one turning over and the remaining two units and six derailed cars zigzagged along the right of way. So it just did not do well. It derailed, flipped, and caught fire. So there's another view of the uh, tailing unit 19C that completely flipped around. So you can see it tops of turbine, and now it's just hanging out there in the field. A locomotive was dispatched to the accident scene from Los Angeles to take the eight cars not derailed back to LA. For passengers, passengers were on this enjoying dinner in the Harvey house at the Union Station while another train was being ready for the trip east. Well, who picked up the tab for that? That's always the mystery that I would want to know every time I read this. I would certainly ask for a free code. Engineer Henry Mayer, assigned to the El Capitan for the past 11 months, escaped injury when this lead unit overturned. His fireman, Lewis Adams, was only slightly injured. Of the 206 passengers, only 17 were injured, with most taken to area hospitals for treatment. There were uh, no deaths. Fletcher was called once again to take the pictures. It's believed that these images have never before been published. Indeed, one of his pictures, that of the culprit rail, was used in the investigation of the accident. You can see the radio announcer in this. The caboose was part of the work train that was sent to the scene of the accident from San Bernardino to clean it up. I mean, this is massive. This is a lot of time to clean something like this up. No foul play was ever indicated, but it was big news for the locals. Some of these pictures were also taken by Bob Drenk, a friend of Fletcher's and a fellow Santa Fe employee. So there you go. That's a zigzag kind of frame, the you know, uh, uh, set that it's in. And these are, by the way, by the way these are passenger cars that you see. So the Los Angeles County Fire Department kept the fire under control and let the diesel fuel burn out itself. So they just let it go. Big hooks, remember that? Were dispatched to the scene from LA and San Bernardino. During the night of cleaning up, three of the units and cars were righted and the burned diesel unit was lifted back on the rails the next day. And all the units were towed to San Bernardino shops for rebuilding and for repair so they could get back to work. Nearly 12 hours were required to restore service on the Los Angeles Division, second district between LA and San Bernardino. During the closure, trains were rerouted over the third district between LA and San Bernardino via Fullerton. So they went out and around. Um, for the next, I think it's like adds like another two or three hours too. For the next five or so years, number 19 stayed out of trouble and worked hard for the Santa Fe. This photo of number 19 was taken by Don Gildersleeve and was shot at Summit in Cajon Pass. It's a beautiful pass. 
Needing a change of scenery, number 19 on December 5th, 1955, took the passenger train to Dallas, Texas on the Santa Fe's new Gainesville, Dallas cutoff. This is a beautiful image of the uh, war bonnet. Continuing in their original F3 suit of a shiny war bonnet, they suddenly went through a change of life when in May of 1972, 19L and 19C were reborn as CF7s. The 19A was sent back to EMD to be metamorphs, meta morphosed into a GP38. So that was the end of this design. 19B also went back to the electromotive division in 1972, became an SD452. So that's it. In 1972, it changed. Um, the last assignment for 19L was working as a CF7 for the rail for the Louisiana Delta Railroad in New um, Iberia, Louisiana. It was finally retired in June 1987. So this is quite a really remarkable history for one locomotive. It got into a lot of trouble. And then, although it, there have been isolated references to number 19 in texts and pictures, Joe believed he had to give Fletcher Swan and his photography most of the credit for motivating him to piece it all together. So because he was called, he was the main photographer. And this was not a time where people had cell phones to take these photographs. It was kind of just who was there, who was carrying a four by five. Today, Joe keeps the memory of the F3 war uh, bonnets alive uh, at the JL ATSF railway, his model train operation. So uh, you see behind me, we have part of this um, collection there, including our friend. We have images all throughout the office of the crash and of uh, uh, the uh, war bonnets. And that's, that's it. This is a, a beautiful story of uh, uh, the, a, a, a story of a beautiful time in, in rail, and um, you know, I think that we can we can see that. Um, let me stop the share. <clears throat> that we always think of it as like this romantic time of travel, but there was real, really, you know, there were some crashes, there were some derailments, there was uh, stuff to to consider before you jumped on and traveled. Uh, so thank you so much for listening to this famous crash. When you go down to uh, Philippe's The Original, just look across the Lisa Street and imagine seeing something like that happen. Thank you, Jared. That was a great presentation. So uh, we are ready for uh, some question and answers. So if you have questions for Jared, uh, click on the Q&A button and uh, we'll go through them. I actually have a uh, question on the chat for you. In the sort of in the middle of the presentation, you were talking about the Redondo Junction. Was that in Redondo Beach? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. So um, the Redondo Junction um, is this is where uh, right now Amtrak has their maintenance facility, and it's 3.5 miles south of Union Station passenger terminal, and southwest of Boyle Heights near Washington Boulevard in the LA River. Um, so. It's also where it holds the airliner up today. Um, but it originally um, uh, built and ran a line from Port Bayona, which is now Playa del Rey in LA to Redondo Junction. So um, it kind of was, but also uh, it, the Redondo, it, it was more about um, it connecting to the Redondo Beach Railway. Um, and that was in April of 1888 by Henry E. Huntington. So that's where it got that name, but um, this was a line that ran from Inglewood to Redondo Beach, and I, that's where it, it, it got that um, that name. I hope that answers the question. So it's it's not exactly in Redondo, but it has a major connections to Redondo, which at the time when it was named that um, was like a connecting point for a lot of different rail. I see. Um, how did the how did the photos end up at Philippe's? That I I'm not sure. You know, because it was there during the crash. My assumption is that um, they acquired a photograph for either from Santa Fe or um, found a print somewhere for sale and purchased it and put it up there because that um, what has a huge you know was a huge part of that uh, establishment's history. Um, but in particular, I don't know if Fletcher personally gave him that photograph or not. I'm not sure how that exactly was acquired. 
um, what was the estimate estimated speed of the locomotive when it broke through the wall? Not fast. I it was truly like I think it was on it was definitely under seven miles per hour. I think it was even under five miles per hour. Um, I've read that some say it was like two to three miles per hour. So it was like the slow build, but because it has such power behind it, um, without the ability to break, still two to three miles per hour being a six hundred thousand pound unit. It's going to do quite a bit of damage. Um, did any of the uh, war bonnets survive without rehab? That's a good question. I I don't believe so. Um, I was looking this up. I, I, I mean, actually, I do believe that there is, I think there is one. Um, let me just check for you right now. If there is, it would be in... Um, let me see. It would be in uh, Sacramento's. Um, uh, it would, I, I would. I think it might be in Sacramento's museum. But I'm. Oh, you know what? What am I saying? Uh, it's. Uh, yes. If you go down to, uh, if you're in Los Angeles, if you go to. Um, oh, we just did a field trip there. Um, the the it used to be called the orange, um, the O-E-R-M, -E Orange Empire Rail Museum. I think now it's called the Southern California um, Rail Museum. It's um, maybe like 40 minutes south of, of Los Angeles. They have, um, they have one that you can see up close. But there's not many of them because they were all redesigned to, uh, or rehabilitated to, to be you know, functioning locomotives. Um, was the diesel fire a separate incident from the broken track incident? Yes. So the diesel fire, or like, was it a separate incident? No, I'm sorry. Um, the diesel fire did happen because of the broken track incident. So that was a part of it. Yes, correct. So when it overturned, it caught, it caught fire. Um, but there was no fire in this crash that we were just talking about. Orange Empire um, rail yard museum. That's where it is. Sorry. Thank you for that. Um, so, so, um, someone else has a notice the crash was near Redondo Junction during 22nd, 1956. Oh, so was somebody, Tony, uh, Valdez says he was there that he was there, there that night. Um, when this other, the crash near Redondo Junction took place. Um, so that's an interesting, so he has a, he has a, a perspective about, um, this uh, this uh, crash that's a little different. So that's it's really interesting. Some of these photos, um, he's he, Tony was asking about the photos that were taken from. So some of these photos um, that of the crash weren't actually the photos, but they were used to reference because we don't have all the photos um, that were of that particular not this number nineteen crash, but the one the second one we we're talking about, and that one um, that one we were using other images that show, that explain what the wreck would look like in particular. So it, it's not necessarily that, that wreck. So it's just to give you a visual idea, a visual reference. Um, any other questions? I see. Um, it's in Paris. Yeah, the one I was talking about, the Southern California Railway Museum is in Paris, um, southeast of Riverside. But their website is oerm.org, and that stands for their old name, which is Orange Empire Rail Railway Museum. Great. Um, oh, and then Charlie pointed out when we were talking about the speed, force equals mass times velocity. It's quite a lot of mass, even though maybe not been a, a giant amount of velocity. Still would equal a lot of force. So there you go. Um, well, if that's all the questions, I, I'm so thankful to have been here to um, tell you about the story. And if you want to know a little bit about the Los Angeles Railway Railroad Heritage Museum, LARHF, we are a, um, a like a rail historical society in Los Angeles. We um, are here in Eagle Rock, California. We have um, a wonderful library 
and we have satellite exhibits with uh, model trains such as these explaining different moments in rail history, particularly in the Los Angeles basin. You might have seen us at an old spaghetti factory in Fullerton or Riverside. You may have seen us at um, the PE, PE the headquarters, or the Huntington headquarters um, in downtown LA. We're at obviously Philippe's the original. We have two exhibits there um, about the Golden Spike and um, another one about circus trains and the history of circus trains. So if you're ever interested, if you're ever doing a dissertation or research project, or you have uh, any scouts in your family who want to get a railroad merit badge, we offer all of this and more. You can just go to our website, LARHF, that's lot, that stands for Los Angeles Railroad Heritage Foundation, .org, LARHF.org, and we're on Facebook and Instagram at LARHF. We have presentations, um, a huge online presence. We offer virtual field trips um, and multiple webinars um, throughout, throughout the year. So I hope that you're interested and, and, and hope to, that you will join us.